everybody it's me again I'm hopping back in um, I'm taking a little break from the world building lecture series because I thought it might be fun to try a reaction video just um, you know because those are a thing and I have a juicy little topic to share with you guys that I think you might have as much fun with as I do so Valentine's Day is coming up and as a single gal I don't have any plans but I thought it might be fun to take a little break from the world building series to do something a little bit different. So I got my moosh because we're going to dive into 18th century love letters, specifically Napoleon's love letters to Josephine. Now back in February of 2018, back before I published Magic Beans, I was still an unpublished author. I wrote a blog post about uh, love letters in general. So the history of love letters, some famous love letters like Captain Wentworth's love letter in Persuasion, um, a letter from um, President Thomas Jefferson, and my favorites are Napoleon's love letters to Josephine. Just a disclaimer, um, this video is in interest of me mocking Napoleon being cloying and weird. I don't know much about French history, to be honest. It's not my thing. Like, I'm vaguely aware of the characters. I mean, obviously, I'm aware of Napoleon and Josephine, but other characters that are mentioned, or historical figures, I suppose, who are mentioned. I don't really know also in the timeline. I know this is, like, early 1800s, like, the first and second decade of the 1800s. That's where we are in this period. It's known as the Regency in England, but it's the Napoleonic era and the rest of Europe. Um, this is around, this is before the War of 1812 in the States, so it's between the Revolution and the War of 1812, just for context for those of you who also are not experts on French and continental history. Um, so I don't know what exactly is happening in any detailed way. I know this is during the Napoleonic Wars when he's building his empire across Europe, but um, in terms of like a detailed timeline, not my area. Josephine was a widow when she met Napoleon. She was widowed in 1794. She married Napoleon in 1796. In 1804, Napoleon was elected emperor. He was elected emperor. That's interesting. So, so Josephine became empress in 1804, and they divorced in 1810. Um, it was a real solemn thing. It was, The reason they divorced was because Napoleon felt that in the interest of his empire, in the interest of France, he had to produce an heir. And he wasn't getting one from Josephine. So that's why they divorced. He didn't really want to. And I, I'm really not sure how she felt about the whole relationship. I know she wasn't happy about the divorce, but I don't really know how she felt about him. I don't know if, like, this was a marriage of awesome convenience for her, or if she just didn't express affection the same way that he did, but I know he wasn't happy with her interaction with him. And the exuberance of his letters are not matched in hers. So I'm not really sure how she felt about the whole thing. I just know she was not happy about being demoted and divorced. Uh, but she, she agreed that it was in the best interest of France, um, for her to essentially step down as, um, resident broodmare. <laughs> in fact, this is really shitty. Uh, in March of the same year, uh, Napoleon married Mary Louise of, sorry, Marie Louise of Austria. And he did say that he was briefly infatuated with her, but more so it is a womb that I am marrying. So just a real charmer, Napoleon. He had a way with the ladies. So basically, even after that, Napoleon still insisted that Josephine uh, retain and use the title of Empress. Uh, I think mostly because he wanted to stay in her good graces because he was still super obsessed with her. And, um, you know, he, he didn't want her to think that he was, that he set her aside because he'd stopped loving her as if she could possibly have that impression, but that he was, uh, 
putting the interest of France above his own feelings, which <laughs> is hilarious to me. I gotta be honest. So Napoleon's and Josephine's, I don't want to say romance. We'll say marriage. Marriage, because that, it was certainly a marriage. It's, it's really weird. There is a really, I don't know, the jury's out on how close they actually were as a couple because it's clear that he was obsessed with her. But her side of it is a little more dicey. Some people are like, oh yeah, she was just as in love with him as he was with her. But some anecdotes about their like behind the scenes interactions and her letters to him are a bit more like so it's it's hard to tell where what was actually going on there I know that obviously he made her empress and even after he divorced her he still insisted that she refer to herself as empress and his last word was Josephine so I think it's fair to say that it was it was real on his part so that being said, it was also real embarrassing on his part because he was, oh boy, he was, he was like, imagine like a 15 year old with like his first like puppy love crush, right? It's all like, but a little bit more adult because he gets a little adult sometimes. It, it's all like passion and obsession and like, you're all I think about and all of my imaginings and all of this is colossal outpouring of love. And it's really awkward and uncomfortable to read because it's just so clumsy. And it's really funny to imagine all of this coming from Napoleon, right? Like he, he just decimated Europe and it's nice to know that he has this really embarrassing side. And just to be clear, I don't feel bad about what I'm about to do to Boney because at the time when he wrote them, they were intercepted by English spies and they were published in English newspapers. So people have been making fun of Napoleon's love letters since he wrote them. So I don't feel super bad about this video. So uh, in my blog post, I mentioned that there was a book called Napoleon's Letters to Josephine translated by, I'm going to say Henry, Foljambe, Foljambe, I can't really, I don't, I've never seen that name before, Hall. So Henry F. Hall. And um, this book sells for a stupid lot of money uh, in hard copy, but somebody over at Project Gutenberg is a hero and I got the whole transcript for free and it's amazing. So we're going to dive into it. Napoleon's letters to Josephine. Now I'm going to only keep the juicy bits because this book is very long because people just talked a lot back then. Their letters were always crazy long. Um, so I'm only going to, I'm going to edit it just for the funniest bits. So there's going to be some context to these letters that are taken. You're going to miss the context of the letters because you don't need to know about where the army is and who's dead and all that. You just, you just need to, you just need to hear the way that this man talked to his wife. So here we have a quote from Colancor, Duke of Vicenza, from looks like 1796 in the book Recollec Recollections of Colancor, uh, Duke of Vicenza, volume one, page 197. And he says, only those who knew Napoleon in the intercourse of private life can render justice to his character. For my own part, I know him, as it were, by heart. And in proportion as time separates us, he appears to me like a beautiful dream. You know, how you talk about your friends. And would you believe that, in my recollections of Napoleon, that which seems to me to approach most nearly to ideal excellence is not the hero filling the world with his gigantic fame, but the man, viewed in the relations of private life. Indeed. All right. So, here we have, this is dated, time-stamped, 7 o'clock in the morning. Dude got up at 7 a.m. to write this. 
My waking thoughts are all of thee, your portrait and the remembrance of last night's delirium. Have robbed my sense of repose, sweet and incomparable Josephine. What an extraordinary influence you have over my heart. Are you vexed? Do I see you sad? Are you ill at ease? My soul is broken with grief, and there is no rest for your lover. But is there more to me when, delivering ourselves up to the deep feelings which master me, I breathe out upon your lips, upon your heart, a flame which burns me up? Ah, it was this past night I realized that your portrait was not you. Go figure. You start at noon. I shall see you in three hours. Meanwhile, mia dolce amor, accept a thousand kisses, but give me none, for they fire my blood. What a poet. You are the constant object of my thoughts. I exhaust my imagination in thinking of what you are doing. If I see you unhappy, my heart is torn, and my grief grows greater. If you are gay and lively among your friends, male and female... I reproach you with having so soon forgotten the sorrowful separation three days ago. Three days, my God. Thence you must be fickle, and henceforth, henceforward, stirred by no deep emotions. So you see, I am not easy to satisfy. But, my dear, I have quite different sensations when I fear that your health may be affected, or that you have cause to be annoyed. Then I regret the haste with which I was separated from my darling. I feel, in fact, that your natural kindness of heart exists no longer for me, and it is only when I am quite sure you are not vexed that I am satisfied. If I were asked how I sleep, I feel that before replying I should have to get a message to tell me that you had a good night. The ailments, the passions of men, influence me only when I imagine they may reach you, my dear. May my good genius, which has always preserved me in the midst of great dangers, may my good genius... He's a very stable genius. Which has always preserved me in the midst of great dangers. Surround you, enfold you, while I will face my fate unguarded. Ah, be not gay, but, trif but a trifle melancholy. Just a little bit sad. And especially may your soul be free from worries as your body from illness. You know what our good Ossian says on this subject. <laughs> that old Ossian. Ah, many a time I have quoted... Ossian on the subject. Write, me dear, and at full length, and accept the thousand and one kisses of your most devoted and faithful friend. A little obsessive, not gonna lie. I have received all your letters, but none has affected me like the last. How can you think, my charmer, of writing me in such terms? Do you believe that my position is not already painful enough, without further increasing my regrets and subverting my reason? What eloquence, what feelings you portray! They are a fire. They inflame my poor heart. My unique Josephine. Away from you there is no more joy. Away from thee the world is a wilderness in which I stand alone, and without experiencing the bliss of unburdening my soul. No friends, I guess. Just Josephine. You have robbed me of more than my soul. Super romantic. You are the only thought of my life. When I am weary of the worries of my profession, when I mistrust the issue... When men disgust me, mood. When I am ready to curse my life, I put my hand on my heart where your portrait beats in unison. I look at it, and love is for me complete happiness, and everything laughs for joy, except the time during which I find myself absent from my beloved. So the portrait's not good enough, I guess. But what art have you learnt how to captivate all of my faculties, to concentrate in yourself my spiritual existence? It is witchery, dear love which will end only with me. To live for Josephine, that is the history of my life. That, that is true, actually, that is true. I am struggling to get near you. I am dying to be by your side, fool that I am. I fail to realize how far I f off I am. The lands and provinces separate us. Whole ass countries. What an age it will be before you read these lines, the weak expressions of the fevered soul in which you reign. Ah, my winsome wife. I know not what fate awaits me, but if it keeps me much longer from you, it will be unbearable. My strength will not last out. There was a time in which I prided myself on my strength, and sometimes, when casting my eyes on the ills which men might do to me, on the fate that destiny might have in store for me, I have gazed steadfastly on the most incredible misfortunes, without a wrinkle on my brow or a vestige of surprise. He's super chill. 
But today the thought that my Josephine might be ill, and above all the cruel, the fatal thought that she might love me less, blights my soul, stops my blood, makes me wretched and dejected, without even leaving me the courage of fury and despair. I often used to say that men have no power over him who dies without regrets, but today, to die without your love, to die in uncertainty of that, is the torment of hell. It is a lifelike and terrifying figure of absolute annihilation. I feel passion strangling me. <laughs> this fucking guy. My unique companion, you whom fate, capital F, fate, has destined to walk with me the painful path of life. The day on which I no longer possess your heart will be that on which parched nature, capital N, will be for me without warmth and without vegetation. I should note at this point he did divorce her. So, maybe ease up on the rhetoric. I stop, dear love, my soul is sad, my body tired, my spirit dazed, men worry me. Mood. I ought indeed to detest them. They keep me from my beloved. Well, if you stopped waging war with everyone, you could just be home. It's a choice. You make a choice. I'm at Port Maurice. No, oh, that's boring. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of this letter, which is uh, referred to as Chauvet is dead. Just because <laughs> this fucking guy. He's not even talking about Josephine that much in this one. It's just kind of funny. My love, I feel the need of consolation. It is by writing to thee, to thee alone, the thought of whom can so influence my moral being, to whom I must pour out my trouble, troubles. Chauvet is dead. He was attached to me. He has rendered essential service to the fatherland. Not, not that fatherland. We're still talking about France. His last words were that he was starting to join me. Yes, I see his ghost. It hovers everywhere. It whistles in the air. His soul is in the clouds. He will be propitious to my destiny. But, fool that I am, I shed tears for our friendship. And who shall tell me that I have not already to bewail the irreparable? Soul of my life, write me by every courier. He means that, by the way. Every courier. Else I shall not know how to exist. I am very busy here. Adieu, adieu, adieu. I am going to dream of you. Sleep consoles me. It places you by my side, I clasp you in my arms, but on waking, alas, I find myself 300 leagues from you. Hard to forget 300 leagues, but... Your letters make up my daily pleasure, and my happy days are not often. Juno, Juno, I assume? Juno bears to Paris 22 flags. You ought to return with him. Do you understand? Do you understand? Be ready, if that is not disagreeable to you. Should he not come, woe with remedy... Should he come back to me alone, brief with consolation, constant anxiety, my beloved, he will see you. He will breathe upon your temples. Perhaps you will accord him the unique and priceless favor of kissing your cheek. Don't ask me to do that. And I, I shall be alone and very far away. But you are about to come, are you not? Are you not? You will soon be beside me, on my breast. In my arms, over your mouth, you will be here over your mouth. But it needs a proofread. Take wings, come quickly, but travel gently. The route is long, bad, fatiguing. If you should be overturned or be taken ill, if fatigue, go gently, my beloved. The two armies are in motion. We are trying to deceive each other. Victory to the most skillful. <laughs> I know not if you want money, for you never speak to me of business. I feel like she can't get a word in it twice. That's. If you do, will you ask my brother for it? He has 200 Louis of mine. I don't know how much 200 Louis is. I'll have to look it up and tell you guys. If you want a place for anyone, you can send him. I will give him one. Chateau Reynard may come too. Bring Chateau Reynard. He's fine. I hasten to send a courier to you. He will stay only four hours in Paris and then bring me your reply. Write me ten pages. That alone can console me a little. You are ill. You love me. I have made you unhappy. You are in delicate health, and I do not see you. Probably because he's 300 leagues away. That thought overwhelms me. I have done you so much wrong that I know not how to atone for it. I accuse you of staying in Paris, and you were ill there. Forgive me, my dear. 
The love with which you have inspired me has bereft me of reason. I shall never find it again. We're going to get to the juicy stuff now. All right, y'all. There's this letter from June 15th of what year? I don't know. June 15th. Um, what year was this? Probably 18 something. I don't know what year this is. There's a letter here. Apparently she's sick. Apparently she went to Paris and caught a cold or something. I actually don't know. I kind of feel a little bit bad. I don't know what's going on in Josephine's life, but apparently she doesn't talk much. So apparently he doesn't know much either. So she's got an illness and he writes like, seriously, I wish I could show you guys how friggin' long this thing is. And it's basically like, I can't console myself thinking that I criticized you for being in Paris. And to know that you're sick is occupying all of my thoughts. And I really hope Hortense is there because I like her better knowing that she's helping you. Like, I like her already. There's a letter about how much he likes Hortense. I don't know who Hortense is. He does refer to her as a sweet child. So maybe she's a relative. I don't know. But um, apparently he feels better knowing Hortense is there. But still, this is, this is a crazy long letter. And he just spends the whole time basically rewording, gee, I feel bad that you're sick. For a month, I have only received from my dear love two letters of three lines each. You know, I get that criticism from my family a lot, that I send a lot of one-word texts. I think Josephine and I would get along. Is she so busy that writing to her dear love is not then needful for her, nor consequently thinking about him? Are you thinking about me at all? To live without thinking of Josephine would be death and annihilation to your husband. Your image gilds my fancies and enlivens the black and somber picture of melancholy and grief. A day perhaps may come in which I shall see you, for I doubt not you will still be at Paris. And verily on that day I will show you my pockets stuffed with letters that I have not sent you because they are too foolish. <laughs> Imagine the ones he didn't send. Yes, that's the word. Good heavens, tell me, you who know so well how to make others love you without being in love yourself. Do you know how you cure me of love? Qu three, three question marks. I will give a good price for that remedy. You ought to have started on May 24th. Being good-natured, I waited till June 1st, as if a pretty woman would give up her habits, her friends, both Madame, both Madame Tallien, and a dinner with Barras and the acting of a new play, and Fortuné, yes, Fortuné, for whom you love much more than your husband, for you, whom you have only a little of the esteem and a share of that benevolence with which your heart abounds. Every day I count up your misdeeds. I lash myself to fury in order to love you no more. No more. Bah! Don't I love you the more? In fact, my peerless little mother... My peerless little mother. I will tell you my secret. Set me at defiance. Stay at Paris. Have lovers. Let everybody know it. Never write me a monosyllable. Never write me a monosyllable. Then I shall love you ten times more for it. And it is not folly, a delirious fever. And I shall not get the better of it. Oh, would I go to heaven? Oh, would to heaven I could get better. But don't tell me you are ill. Don't try to justify yourself. Good heavens, you are pardoned. I love you to distraction, and never will my poor heart cease to give you all for love. If you did not love me, my fate would be indeed grotesque. You have not written me. You are ill. You do not come. But you have passed Lyon. You will be at Turin on the 28th, at Milan on the 30th, where you will wait for me. You will be in Italy, and I shall be still far from you. Adieu, my well-beloved. A kiss on my mouth, another on my heart. We have made peace with Rome, who gives us money. Tomorrow we shall be at Leghorn, and as soon as I can, in your arms, at your feet, on your bosom. That one's my favorite so far. All right. We are not, we are, we are barely started, y'all. We are like... I'm just going to start picking them at random because if I like go down the list, we're going to be here all day. I'm going to lose the light and I'm not doing all of this again tomorrow.
This is December 3rd, 1806, at noon. To the Empress. Yours of November 26th received. I noticed two things in it. Two things. Count them. You say I do not read your letters. It is an unkind thought. I take your bad opinion, anything but kindly. You tell me that perhaps it is a mere fantasy of the night, and you add that you are not jealous. I found out long ago that angry persons always assert that they are not angry. That those who are afraid keep on re repeating that they have no fear. You, therefore, are convinced of jealousy. I am delighted to hear it. Nevertheless, you are wrong. I think of nothing less, and in the desert plains of Poland, one thinks little about beauties. No pretty women in Poland. None. None of them. I had yesterday a ball of the provincial nobility. The women, good-looking enough. No beauties in Poland, but the women are fine. <laughs> Rich enough. Dowdy enough. Although, in Paris fashions. Adieu, dear. I'm in good health. Yours ever. Napoleon. Still, you must calm yourself. I wrote that I was in Poland. That, when we were established in winter quarters, you would come. You will have to wait a few days. The greater one becomes, the less one can consult one's wishes, being dependent on events and circumstances. You can come to Frankfurt or Darmstadt. I am hoping to send for you in a few days, that is, if circumstances will permit. The warmth of your letter makes me realize that you, like other pretty women, know no bounds. What you will must be, but as for me, I declare that of all men I am the greatest slave. My master has no pity, and his master is the nature of things. Adieu, dear. Keep well. The person that I wish to speak to you about is Madame L. of whom everyone is speaking ill. <laughs> oh, what a bitch. They assure me that she is more Prussian than French women. Damn. I don't believe it, but I think her an idiot who talks nothing but trash. <laughs> oh, God. I love this book, y'all. I love this book. The Queen of Prussia is really charming. She is full of coquetry for me. But do not be jealous. I am an oilcloth, over which all that can only glide. It would cost me too much to play the lover. I love that this is a letter you write to your wife. He wrote this to his wife. Like, the Queen of Prussia, she's like super into me, but I was like, nah. Eh. <laughs> oh, the 1800s, man. It was wild. People got away was so much. Also, that was the extent of the letter. That was, like, the whole letter. I love that, like, they sent letters, like, handwritten and, like, stamped with wax and sent by courier the same way we send texts. Like, I just want to, like, have her send him a letter, like, sit down to pen a letter at her desk and be like, you want pizza? And for him to, like, take two weeks to write back. Eh. <laughs> ah. Okay, so here's another one. This is uh, dated November 5th, uh, 1808. I am at Tolosa. I am starting for Vittoria, where I shall be in a few hours. I am fairly well, and I hope everything will soon be completed. Period. Send it. I mean, a lot of times they wrote these crazy long letters, but a lot of times, like... Just checking in. Just... I'm at the hotel, just calling you before I go to bed. I'm going to go find another verbally abusive one. Kovis art is of no use to me. I have received your letter. Be careful, and I advise you to be vigilant. For one of these nights, you will hear a loud knocking. My health is good. I know nothing about the rumors. I have never been better for many a long year. One of these nights, you will hear a loud knocking. I want to know what that's about. Like, judging from, because some of his letters he writes to her and he's like, I'm going to be there and you're going to be surprised. I wonder if this is him being like, I'm going to be, it's going to be me. Or if it's like, I don't know, there's creeps in that house. Like, I don't know what that's a reference to. And I kind of feel cheated. Like, I read the letters like above and below that one on the list. And he doesn't say anything about, like, that's a weird farmhouse. Sure, it's haunted. He's just always kind of like, he just, he just says, 
One of these nights, you'll hear a loud knocking. So, keep an ear out, Josephine. Lock your doors. So this is April 21st, 1810. So this is a while. Well, I mean, a few months after they were divorced. I have... I have yours of April 18th. It is written in a bad style. Get it together, Josephine. I am always the same. People like me do not change. I do not know- I know not what Eugene has told you. I have not written to you because you have not written to me, and my sole desire is to fulfill your slightest inclination. So at this point, they're still, like, playing it cool. Like, we maybe shouldn't be chatting as much as we used to, because it looks a bit rum. You know, because we got divorced and all that, and now you're married to somebody else. It'd be a little weird. I mean, everybody knows. Like, there's nobody that doesn't know that they're still talking because he's, like, still obsessed with her. So, and I can imagine her being, like, buddy chill. Maybe ease up a little bit. And I think, between you and me, I think she maybe saw it as kind of, like, a break. Like, she's bummed out about not being empress in a practical sense anymore. And nobody, like, I mean, she she was widowed. By her first husband and then she's divorced by her second one so it's not a great look for an early 19th century woman but i think she was still kind of like there's probably a little bit of her that was relieved not to get these needy ass letters anymore i think i would be but then you know i'm a bitter spinster so what do i know now this is the like the largest outpouring of affection i've seen from josephine a thousand thousand loving thanks for not having forgotten me. With what impetuosity I read it, and yet I took a long time over it, for there was not a word which did not make me weep. But these tears were very pleasant ones. I have found my whole heart again, such as it will always be. There are affections which are life itself, and which can only end with it. I was in despair to find my letter of the 19th had displeased you. I do not remember the exact expressions, but I know what torture I felt in writing it, the grief at having no news from you. So, I, th I feel like, I feel like that's a bit put on. I don't want to be rude. I don't want to call Josephine a liar, but I feel like she knows how to work with him, if you know what I mean. Like, you ever been in one of those relationships, like romantic, platonic, familial, whatever, where you know what buttons to push and what buttons not to push. And you kind of get used to a certain way of talking to somebody in such a way that they won't kick off. I feel like that's what she's doing. I feel like she's mimicking his style to kind of keep him cool. All right, this one's from 1796. So this is like pretty soon after they got married. I write very often and you seldom. You are naughty and undutiful, very undutiful as well as thoughtless. It is disloyal to deceive a poor husband, an affectionate lover. Ought he to lose his rights because he is far away, up to the neck in business, worries and anxiety? Without his Josephine, without the assurance of her love, what in the wide world remains for him? What will he do? Yesterday we had a very sanguinary conflict. The bloody fight. You know, the huge. The enemy has lost heavily and been completely beaten. We have taken from him the suburbs of Mantua. Adieu, charming Josephine. One of these nights the door will be burst open with a bang, as if by a jealous husband. Wonder who that could be. And in a moment I shall be in your arms. A thousand affectionate kisses. Napoleon. Charmer. I start at once for Verona. I had hoped to get a letter from you, and I am terribly uneasy about you. You were rather ill when I left. I beg you not to leave me in such uneasiness. Stop getting sick. It worries me. You promised me to be more regular, and at the time, your tongue was in harmony with your heart. You, to whom nature has given a kind, genial, and wholly charming disposition, how can you forget the man who loves you with so much fervor? No letters from you for three days. And yet I have written to you several times. To be parted is dreadful. The nights are long, stupid and wearisome. The day's work is monotonous. It's so boring, leading an army. It's so boring. This evening, alone with my thoughts, work in correspondence with men and their stupid schemes. <laughs> Mood. I have not even one letter from you which I might press to my heart. He doesn't keep these letters? 
Like, I imagine him, like, like stapling them to the wall of his tent. The staff is gone. I set off in an hour. Tonight, I get an express from Paris. There was for you only the enclosed letter. Which will please you? Think of me. Live for me. Be often with your well-beloved, and be sure that there is only one misfortune that he is afraid of, that of being no longer loved by his Josephine. A thousand kisses, very sweet, very affectionate, very exclusive. <laughs> Alright, so this one's back in 1809. I found you today weaker than you ought to be. Get it together. You have shown courage. It is necessary that you should remain, maintain it and not give way to a doleful melancholy. You must be contented and take special care of your health, which is so precious to me. If you are not attached to me, and if you love me, you should show strength of mind and force yourself to be happy. Force yourself, Josephine. You cannot question my constant and tender friendship. This is tender. And you would know very imperfectly all the affection I have for you if you imagined that I can be happy if you are unhappy and contented if you are ill at ease. Sleep well. Dream that I wish it. I have had no letter from you for several days. The pleasures of Malmaison. Mal Malmaison? Malmaison? I don't know. The beautiful greenhouses, the beautiful gardens, cause the absent to be forgotten. It is, they say, the rule of your sex. Everyone speaks only of your good health. All of this is very suspicious. My health is fairly good. <clears throat> I have been without letters from you for two days. That is at least the thirtieth time today that I have made this observation to myself. I've thought about this thirty times, that it's been two days. You are thinking this particularly wearisome. Can't imagine why. Yet you cannot doubt the tender and unique anxiety with which you inspire me. We attacked Mantua yesterday, blah blah blah. A lot of people dead. A thousand kisses, as fiery as my soul, as chaste as yourself. I have summoned the courier. He tells me that he crossed over to your house and that you told him you had no commands. Fie, naughty, undutiful, cruel, tyrannous, jolly little monster. You laugh at my threats, at my infatuation. Ah, you well know that if I could shut you up in my breast, I would put you in prison there. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Tell me you are cheerful, in good health, and very affectionate. Napoleon. Lord, you guys. I'm very anxious to know how you are, what you are doing. I have been in the village of Virgil, on the banks of the lake, by the silvery light of the moon, and not a moment without dreaming of Josephine. The enemy made a general sortie on June 16th. It has killed or wounded 200 of our men, but lost 500 of its own in a precipitous retreat. I am well. I am Josephine's entirely. I have no pleasure or happiness except in her society. Three ne Neapolitan regiments have arrived at Brescia. They have surrendered themselves from the Austrian army in consequence of the convection convention I have concluded with Monsieur Pignatelli. I've lost my snuff box. This letter is all over the place. Please choose me another, rather flat-shaped, it has to be flat-shaped, and write something pretty inside, with your own hair. A thousand kisses, as burning as you are, cold. <laughs> Boundless love and fidelity, up to every proof. Before Joseph starts, I wish to speak with him. This is all the same sentence, by the way. This is a wild letter. Ever since I left you, I have been sad. I am only happy when by your side... Ceaselessly, I recall your kisses, your tears, your enchanting jealousy. I love that you're jealous. And the charms of the incomparable Josephine keep constantly alight, a bright and burning flame in my heart and senses. When free from every worry, from all business, shall I spend all my moments by your side, to have nothing to do but to love you and to prove it to you? I shall send your horse, but I am hoping that you will soon be able to rejoin me. I thought I loved you some days ago, but since I saw you, I feel that I love you even a thousand times more. Ever since I have known you, I worship you more every day, which proves how false is the maxim of La Bruyere that love comes all at once. Everything in nature has a regular course and different degrees of growth. Ah, pray, let me see some of your faults. Let me see some of your faults. 
be less beautiful, less gracious, less tender, and especially less kind. Above all, never be jealous, never weep. Your tears madden me, fire my blood. Be sure that it is no longer possible for me to have a thought except for you, or an idea of which you shall not be the judge. Have a good rest. Haste to get well. Come and join me, so that at least before dying we could say we were happy for so many days. <laughs> Millions of kisses. Millions of kisses. Even to Fortune A, in spite of his naughtiness. Bonaparte. I love this one. I have beaten the enemy. Kilmaine will send you the copy of the dispatch. I am tired to death. Mood. Pray start at once for Verona. I need you, for I think that I'm going to be very ill. Boy. <clears throat> Can't imagine her turning down that offer. I send you a thousand kisses. I am in bed. Send it. I'm going to end it there, because... This uh, thing is already very long, and it's going to be a pain in the butt to edit. But I hope this has been fun for you guys. Uh, I will post a link. Um, maybe my blog post? Go find it. It's a good one. And um, it's a lot of fun. This book is great. Uh, I think it'll be fun to, like, take bits and pieces of it and, like, quote them in your own love letters in a sort of, like, don't be creepy about it. Be like a historical little wink nudge about it. Don't don't be creep. Don't be obsessive. Napoleon was obsessive. Don't be like Napoleon. Also, don't take over most of Europe. Don't do that. They don't like it. Um, but anyway, yeah, I hope this has been fun. It's been a hell of a lot of fun for me. Cringe. But fun. And so funny. And um, I'll see you guys next week to continue the world building class. We'll be talking about... We'll be starting the section on culture. And I think next week is social organization, forms of government, and economic systems. So it's going to be good. It's going to be a, a lot less silly than this, but hopefully still good. All right. Uh, if you enjoyed this and you want more like it, um, do comment that you enjoyed it because I love doing history things, even though this particular time and place is not my wheelhouse. I'm always happy to research. So, um, yeah, um, I'm, I plan on doing a lot of things like this, a lot of like little history tidbits. So be sure to subscribe so that you will know when those are out and also give me a like and some comments telling me how you liked this video. Okay. So I will see you guys next week. Bye.